I am indeed so pleased to join all of you in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Declaration of the United Nations International Day of Peace, a day dedicated to commemorating and strengthening the ideals of peace and the avoidance of war within and among all nations and people. When I decided on the title, Building the Mind of Peace, I was minded of Joseph Needham's words, the man who founded UNESCO, who wrote that wars begin in the minds of men, and that is where peace needs to be built. So I've thought about the implications of this uh, when I got the invitation to speak. And the question I put to myself, uh, what are the requirements of such a noble ethical achievement? And I would like to make some suggestions uh, in this regard. First of all, therefore, all that influences the minds of people will influence the prospects for such peace being created. May I say immediately that if we have a version of economics that is allegedly rational, but is irrational in its consequences, that is a factor that we cannot afford to ignore. I've said it is necessary to respect complexity so that the same paths to peace are, either, are neither appropriate nor will they function in different circumstances. The dynamics of memory, the memory of conflict, the sources of conflict differ in different parts. So there isn't a single formula. It makes it very difficult to describe quantitatively, even as you have had it presented to you, who could not be moved by the benefits of peace or the benefits of the reduction of conflict as you have just presented. But if one was to try to get to the ground, as I am trying to do, to try and raise the questions that therefore constitute, to some extent, the obstacles, I think it is necessary, as I've said, to respect complexity. By that I mean there isn't a single source to a conflict. I have had the experience over 40 years of visiting areas of massacre, areas of great famine, like in Somalia 20 years ago, areas of transition and hope later lost, such as the transition from dictatorship in Salvador and transitions from dictatorship in Nicaragua, the wonderful joyous moment of the overthrow of dictatorship in Chile, the struggle of people in Turkey, and all of these I will talk about in a moment, not in detail, but because they raise moral issues uh, for myself in terms of what kind of response do you make. I'm worried about description. I'm worried about descriptions that do not go to the root of the moral question, which is the one of, for example, is our approach rational or does it carry irrational elements within it? I can be more specific as well. The creation of peace cannot be divorced from history, nor from the critical relationship between history, economics, philosophy, ethnicity, and religious belief. It is important if we are to use the discourse of human rights, for example, that we realize that there is a strong element of the human rights discourse that assumes that it is a rational achievement from what is regarded as the European Enlightenment. It is also a fact that there are many people who believe that their essential humanity, experienced through their heart, is revealed to them. That revelation is as important as rationality. We cannot forever imagine that a lesser scholarship will do peace studies or a lesser scholarship will do development studies, or a lesser scholarship will do human rights discourse. They are all connected. I want to say that this means too that the building of the mind of peace and achieving peace involves very much more than the absence of war. The building of peace involves the absence of fear. And that is why there is such a close connection between the preparation of underclasses through, through deprivation, 
from anana, from self-worth, taking a mata sense phrase, to be able to participate in one's social world without shame. If that happens to a whole generation of young people who also have other reasons for perceiving that they are not included, what are the implications of that? The absence of fear where we do encounter it involves the recognition of a fundamental dignity. And perhaps that is the only concept that I say now after 30 years in the human rights area that travels across all cultures and all circumstances, dignity. Beyond the formal statements of rights too, their integration and implementation is important. For example, the history of the United Nations that we all want to see an institution, the only ones we have, that I want to see strengthened, are ones that raise serious issues of integration and implementation of principles. Very often, all over the world, the best-minded people come to a point of advocacy as I did, working with others who are in this room, in seeking a ban on cluster munitions. But it is important that we drive on the advocacy past the point of the achieved text towards monitoring, implementation, and so is seeing delivery. I think maybe the tragic weakness, the legacy morally, globally, is the failure to link civil and political rights to social, economic, and cultural rights. I think that you know as I see these, what I have just seen now, I see behind a statistical presentation something else. How can, for example, Nigeria pump so much more oil and yet fall down on the United Nations Index a couple of points? What is happening, the distribution of revenue, the issues of power within the countries cannot be neglected a point that I want to return to. And accepting these truths then, the advocacy for peace cannot confine itself, as I suggest, to reacting to the consequences of war. It must analyze the sources. And in my own 34 years, I've sometimes felt quite hopeless dealing with the consequences of war. As an activist and a writer and a diplomatic representative, I have visited trials with 259 death sentences sought in Turkey, Western Sahara, where conflict goes on since 74, Nicaragua, which had its moment of celebrating freedom, Chile, Gaza, under siege, the West Bank, Israel, Peru, El Salvador, Cambodia, Iraq, Somalia. And I've met people there. And I leave and come home and acknowledge and note the high price that many of them are paying for, for, are paying for, for, for their work. I've seen hope in the steps towards transition. The people after the, the uh, Samosa dictatorship learning to read. A woman so thinking reading was so wonderful that she would read the entire electoral act at a, at a polling station while the queues piled up all around us. But I think that when I think of all of this, I think of what do you do if you say you're interested in peace, if you're an observer? I'm very conscious of a warning that is contained in a very powerful piece of writing. It was something, you know, I was being given the McBride Peace Prize in 1992. I used a poem of Pedilas. And the poem went with like this, Herberto Pedillo wrote about the travelers, and it's a great warning to us all. They come in the close of the affluent society, a thorn in whose side they are, whose unreliable elements they constitute, fitted out with academic titles, writing books for the Department of Sociology of the best universities, which underwrite the cost. They get their visas in a jiffy, are informed about anti-war campaigns, about protests against the Vietnam War. In short, they are treading the righteous path of history. While they lounge in the shiny seats of the international airports, each flight they take an illegal act, they feel pleasantly subversive. 
their conscience is clean. They are the comfortable travellers of the wave of the future, with Roliflex cameras perfectly suited for the tropical light, for underdevelopment, with information charts, for objective interviews, if however, of course, something less than impartial, for they love the struggle, the guerrillas, the zafras, the hardships of life, the vulgar Spanish of the natives. Hans Magnus Eisenberg used that for his essay, Tourists of the Revolution, and I've always regarded it as a warning. And it has been one of my own sensations on leaving an area. What now happens? I wrote, it is no longer sufficient. I believe what I think happens is this. I believe that the given society can exist in comfort only if a pro what happens you if you were in such a situation. Well, those, and there are many in the majority, who are fairly conservative, they can go on by averting their gaze. That is the way the world is. They will always be at it, killing each other. But then if you decide to look more closely and ask the question, you have a choice to either do nothing and live with a guilty conscience, with an averted gaze for the rest of your life, or you have the choice of allowing yourself to be changed forever. And if one was to be changed forever, you are not changed in terms of the description because we've all done it. You've changed in what you want to ask about international economic structures, about bureaucratic structures in relation to the development area itself, to the United Nations, to regional organizations, to hit and run events. What do I feel, for example, of having been in Baidoa where 250 people a day were dying over 20 years ago. And to see the cameras of the world come and go away again, and now people starve again in Somalia. Or to hear when I was in South America, when a small famine took place in Brazil, that it couldn't be covered because there were no stills. This is the uncomfortable truth of our relationship to war and conflict and disaster. I wrote in my book, Causes for Concern in 2006. It is no longer sufficient to offer ethically superior gestures in favor of peace and against war. It is essential for all defenders of human rights to offer a critique, a map that would show how it is that many potentially good people acquiesce in acts of war, terror, economic exploitation, patriarchy, willful torture, forced famine, degrading job destruction, poverty and exclusion against their fellow human beings. There is a public need for moral courage, for rage, agitation, organization, and struggle in favor of this humanistic project. It is not, I repeat, sufficient to make the ethical case for peace and simply to assert the moral superiority of such a position. By contrast, I believe that it is essential for peace movements to interpret the conditions that have made possible the acquiescence of so many in so many different cultures at so many different times in constitutional arrangements that have sustained and re reproduced a systematic, pervasive, and corrosive violence in so many conflict zones in our world. Peace movements must be a focal point for action, and they must develop even more their critique of how fear is embedded in what is called the socializing institutions of their own countries. Socializing institutions of family, education, workplace, state, and even community. So building the mind of peace is not about changes in legislation or systems in governments only. It is not only about the placing down of arms and the taking up of ballot papers. It is also about changes in administration, changes in the way we treat each other, most importantly about changes in consciousness. That shift in consciousness towards a mind of peace means a respect for, as I've said, the fundamental dignity and equality of each human being, seeing them not as a symbol, but as a fellow human being. It also requires a recognition that it is by working together in a shared or even a contested space that we can begin to move forward. Emil Kadzin, in his, not, in his diary published last year by Yale, speaks of coming out after Labour had won the election in 1945 in a bombed site in Britain, and seeing suddenly as all the efforts are going on, of the difference between working in a collective sense 
and something emerging from it that was greater than all the individual efforts. And the difference between that and going out and feeling afraid in a public space. Who is involved in the building of peace is important. Not just the former combatants, though they need to be there, but also those who have tried to survive in the spaces between war. When I was in Colombia last year, one of the most frightening things about it was that an alleged decommissioning had taken place in certain areas where women were still being forced to give up their sons, now to protect the traffic of narco traffic. And in that, when the woman speaks out of her heart and to Buenaventura and she says, I am so glad she came, desperately waiting for someone to hear that no, the conflict was not over, that it required deeper changes. I think the women's groups, the communities, the civil society, there are so many places where all this quest has to happen. One of the more deadly strains running through, however, that obstruct, obstructs so much of this is the suggestion that conflict is inevitable or that authoritarianism is inevitable or that there is a single superior version of rationality that is only to arrive at these dark places. May I suggest that the work of James C. Scott and others reminds us about how anthropology as a subject was used as a tool of imperialism in the 19th century, but neglected in this century and the previous one as a tool that might have identified the rich, rich resources of indigenous wisdom, the clan system that could have been used in Somalia. In addition to that, in relation to all the other forms of medicines that could have been used by respecting indigenous wisdom people who had remembered differently because they had a different experience. I think that it is hopeful because by constructing new networks and by utilizing new technologies, there are individual sparks for peace that can create patterns of influence, influenced by the new subjects. Every subject I know needs to be recast in a scholarly way to get rid of some of the baggage and assumptions that it is carrying. And I'm meaning every one of them that are informing the development practice. And I think as well, in relation to the state, we have to realize if I, as somebody who is elected, and do not say that I am lesser, I refuse to say that, because I have submitted my name to the electorate or because I have become a member of the party that I in turn influenced in the development area, I think that I want to say that the state have a role. The state's authority merged with other states enables us to make a coherent response at the very highest level. But there are places where the partnership between the civil society and the state is incredibly important. Both have allowed the Chicago School of Economics to be accepted as a single inevitable version of progress in economics in the world. Few have the courage to stand in front of that building and say, from that building, people went to tell, to tell the army, to tell Pinochet how to run Chile at the cost of Chileans. Prizes from around the world have snowed down on different people who have participated in actions like that. You cannot have it both ways. We are morally tested for authenticity in our language, in our affiliation, in our practice, in our desperate attempts to try and put pieces together in our intellectual work. What I find striking, by the way, as far as the media is concerned in the coverage of current international conflict, is the complete disrespect, exclusion of all the things I've mentioned about native peoples, peoples under threat, peoples who are the most immediate victims of climate change. I had a powerful example presented to me when I was participating, making a documentary at the United Nations Conference in Economics and Development in Rio. There, Morris Strong, Assistant General Secretary of the United Nations, had arranged for the Business Council for Sustainable Development to be given full membership as if it were a state. In a boat run by Greenpeace, where all of the atolls and all of the smaller countries in the Pacific who were immediately in threat from the rising sea level. That was just simply one of those logical consequences of empire not challenged, of imperialism not challenged, of colonization not challenged. So can you have all the ethics without asking the hard questions? I believe not. 
I've often asked myself also the question as to whether it is possible to aspire to a universal ethic. I do believe it's something we must do, something that would transcend the postulates of different cultures and receive popular acceptance. Something that would be both national and international. To speculate on the answer to such a question is insufficient. You have to make it, you have to offer. I believe that we must forge ahead with what we had. And I was believe that this will happen to countries at home as well as what they are trying to suggest abroad. Who could not be moved by the courageous, admirable and powerfully moral reaction to the, of the Norwegian people in their recent circumstance? which said, we will not be driven from our path of peace. We will be more peaceful, more open, more democratic, and we will offer that legacy of memory of tragedy onto the next generation. That was a powerful ethic in itself. I believe we must all seek to work, but seek to eliminate internally the sources of conflict. Yes, there are things we as parliamentarians, and I was there for more than 30 years, do. I am happy about what Ireland does abroad. It's that part of our reputation that is undamaged. Peace building, peacemaking. But there are other things that we could now do. We could, for example, develop new skills in relation to, I think, new skills in relation to rapid response to humanitarian, uh, humanitarian needs. With that, that airport that was used to facilitate soldiers coming through for Iraq, could be used now in a powerfully different way. As well as that, we could give a lead in scholarship in putting the indigenous rights back into the discourse. There are technical things that we can do in assuring the debate on climate, for example, that we offer to redress the technical imbalance. Above all else, we should not participate in the current incredible attempt to privatize land in so much of the developing world. We should try and enable those women in Africa, for example, who till most of the day, 80% of the tillage, but none of the rights, and show that we will be in favour as a country that struggle for our own land for a version that will be honourable. I think we need also, as well as that, to try and move on in the descriptions of a bureaucratic kind to qualitative indices. And I think in all of this, what is very important, we should realise that that thing which is universal on a day which we are devoted to peace. Every now and again, in villages everywhere, they play their drums, they play music, and they, say, they sing sounds that are always being recreated in a creative way into our common, shared, vulnerable planet. For all these reasons, there is no greater moral project into the next decade than of trying to continually see at micro level, at macro level, at institutional level, and in every part of the discourse, the challenge of building the mind of peace. Garamila Ma.